Hello, everybody. Welcome to our World Today, Viennese Perspective, our discussion a weekly where we discuss what happens throughout the world and uh, any topic of interest that we know we can heal or discuss in a different way. Um, today, we are... There is a lot of things to talk about, actually. Um, politics was like very out there this week. Um, starting with the election of 2024, even though the candidates are taking a little bit of a break um, in their state's campaign, um, there seemingly was a second assassination um, attempt on Donald Trump. So we'll be talking a little bit about that for like five to ten minutes at the beginning. And then we're going to launch straight into most of our programs. We want to talk about Mexico and the fact that it's starting to um, elect its judges instead of having them named by uh, political figures. Um, then Kentucky, the governor, um, wants to ban conversion therapy, therapy and is in the process of doing that. And then we'll um, finish on something a little bit lighter, but probably a little bit linked to everything that we're talking about. And we will um, discuss why Singaporeans live to up to 100 years old or more. So interesting topics. Um, we are going to launch right into it with something that I did not uh, follow at all. Um, because circumstances, uh, this is kind of unusual to me, but our American friends probably have heard everything about it. And it's like the second assassination att attempt, murder attempt um, on Donald Trump. And so I would like my friend Sage to kind of summarize everything that's been happening here and what we can, um, what you can, um, I guess, discuss from it what again lessons of what is happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So over the weekend, there was um, the, an assassination attempt on Donald Trump. Um, again, this time, um, the situation was very different. So um, basically, he was golfing in West Palm Beach, Florida. The Secret Service had warned him that it would be very difficult to secure the area if he were golfing because the a golf course is um, a huge area. So it would take like so many secret service agents, right? Like a thousand or something to properly protect him at the golf course and clear the site. And um, then sure enough, there ended up being discovered a rifle barrel poking out from some bushes. Um, the Secret Service noticed that first before anything happened. So they started shooting at the guy there and he ran away and fled in a vehicle, but he was caught on the highway nearby. And so anyway, they took him into custody uh, for this one. And I think his name was John Wesley Ruth, but I might be getting that wrong. Um, and then there might be a bias to make it sound like John Wilkes Booth, the Lincoln assassination guy. Um, but I'm pretty sure it was John Wesley Ruth. But anyway, they found the rifle, some food, because he had been staking the place out since like around 1 or 2 a.m. that morning um, for about like 13 hours or something. Um, and they found, um, yeah, just other stuff that would help him carry out the assassination attempt. So they didn't really find any clear motive yet, but he was really outspoken in favor of Ukraine, you know, and, um, <clears throat> had even visited there. So it could be that and has made some unhinged social media posts. So, yeah, but then there's this whole political discussion about it now um just talking about like political violence in america and there hasn't been anything like this again in like 40 years besides the previous assassination attempt in june and um yeah and then you know that that was the the reaction um from like kamala harris and joe biden and such 
course, to call him and talk to him and make sure that things were okay and just saying that political violence isn't acceptable. Um, Donald Trump used it as an opportunity to suggest that um, rhetoric from the Democrats is causing him to be um, threatened. His life is being threatened because people are hearing things about him that are negative. So this was the discussion and nobody was harmed, you know, in this, not even the perpetrator or the suspect rather. So yeah, that's what we have. Renville, did you want to say yeah. something about that? Renville, Grenville. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, the, the interesting thing is I actually heard about it in one, on one of the radio stations in South Africa. And the one thing that was also said was that Elon Musk was actually quoted as saying, you know, why is it that it's only Trump being targeted and not Biden and Harris and any Democrats. And that created a little bit of an outcry on X because people were saying he was then inciting violence towards the other candidates. So, I mean, you know, just, to, just offhand. And I think this time around, I kind of want to say, like, what is the purpose of these things happening now? Is it publicity stunts? And I'm not saying either one of them are faking it. It could very easily be somebody else playing up the publicity value of these kind of things. But like just from a purpose point of view, it doesn't serve any purpose other than to probably heighten up the publicity around the election, negative or good. It's just, it feels like it's it's a tactical thing, but I'm not sure whose tactic it is right now. I'm not certain of the intent of it. Because when Sage shared that it, like, it hasn't happened in over 40 years, you kind of have to wonder what would be the value of resurfacing this type of thing now. Is there value in it creating publicity or is there still again potentially a deflection from something else that's happening that we're not fully aware of and that we are being almost dissuaded from paying attention to? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I feel like I want to... Um get into it too deep because like we won't have answers on it by by doing so but um i shared a video in the chat about like a uh, former make america great again republican um turned blue and um he probably made this title kind of for people to to stop on his video and he explained his choice and it was very um articulate about explaining his choice and and that kind of reminded me of the fact that um the suspect is, is probably we, we think like he, he's a former republican maga Rep republican right so he was explaining that um he fear was the the component of of most of his choice and it was not just about being Republican or maybe not even about that, but the fact that every time that his friends were expressing their opinions, people from the other party would like violently threaten them physically, um, no matter if they were Democrats or Republicans. The fact that um, he was pro-immigration because he knew that immigration built uh, the country, but that he was scared of crime, scared of things, scared of everything. And and he was just scared about his life. And people are just scared about crime. I think like the most searched terms for the elections right now at the moment are like crime, social security, and healthcare. People are just scared about their well-being. And and I think he had the very he had the courage of, of going online 
and being very articulate about it. And um, if anyone wants to, wants to watch his video and has TikTok, like you're welcome to. Um, but basically what he was saying is like, hey, like no matter what you choose, like don't choose out of fear. And I think it's a great parallel to that. Um, and that's the only thing that I would say because like, I don't want conspiracy theories. I'm, I'm tired of that. Is basically that um, in no way is it justified to use violence in politics, um, in no matter with the form. Um, maybe Trump uses violence verbally, and maybe that's his lesson to heal, and maybe that's why he's attracting this. We don't know. But most of all, I, it's not okay to attempt to someone's life. And and it's not okay that we are going 50 to 60, 70 years back on this. Um, that should not happen. And it's not okay to try to um, divide the country, hello Musk, on, on saying that why is it that it is just Trump that is um, being, whose life is being attempted. This is not about that. Like life is not a matter of, of of politics, and I think people are taking politics pretty much out of context or um, using very sick behaviors and patterns and injecting them into it when it's not that actually. It should be a balance. It should be healthy. Um, it should be fun. And I think that's what the, the person on the video was saying, like um, Kamala Harris, like I don't know how perfect or how bad she is, but she brought fun again into politics. That's what I was saying. Okay, that's his point. But I think he has something there because like, why is it that um, we're having like um, still black, you know, crime on black people today, still like um, assassination attempts, still things that are that are political pretty much and that um, are very entrenched into the pattern of the country and I think we have to take a hard look at that and 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 it's important to really say that all right like wh where do we stop and I think that's what we were talking about last week where do we stop where where is the limit where is the boundary where is the peace? Um, freedom does should not never come at the cost of um, I don't know life. Um, it should never come to what we're experiencing now, and I think that's where I would like peacefully, but still say like I think it's time to just like step back and say no there. But that's my my that's my sole opinion. And I think pe other people have other opinion, of course. Uh, people want to speculate, they want to find like why this is happening and I understand. But I think that the core spiritually is for me that. So does anyone else, um, anything that we would like to piggyback on or a completely different insight on, on what is happening right now? So the only other thing I would like to say is that given what you've just shared, the deflection now makes sense because last week we spoke to the content of the election campaigns and we're still not completely clear on what value either party is bringing or proposing to take forward in this country. And so if you actually look at the campaigns almost being devoid of a value promise, something else has to keep the election top of mind in people's minds. And so how else do you do it other than inflammatory politics? Nadia? Yes, I wanted to mention what you were talking about when it comes to even nowadays, we are still experiencing segregation and politics within segregation. And I feel like it's like a power and control type play here where people need to make other people feel like they don't belong in this country. 
Because if they do make them feel like this, then they feel powerful and they feel like they're at a supremacy compared to uh, other groups. And going from Martin Luther King and what he suggested, he also had the same feeling of wanting to belong within the boundaries of a country. Like if you're within the country lines, then you are an American and you belong here. And to believe otherwise is not the truth. Hmm. Yeah, that's very well expressed. Um, that's a good point, actually. Good. Anything else before we move on to our next topic? No? Pretty complete here. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's good to leave it at that. Um, and all of what you were expressing, um, all of you, each of you, was very powerful. And uh, I hope that people watching will also have like opinions on this and they would like to share, like um, you're very welcome to share in the comments um, if you want to participate in the discussion, even afterwards. So let's move on to our next topic, which is that uh, Mexico is deciding to amend its constitution and, and it will require for judges to be elected by the people. That is something that does not happen often, um, specifically before, because I think the fundamentals of the Republic uh, worldwide is that like there is something about like the government and then there is the parliament and then there is the judiciary system and they're all very separated. And so they all have very different processes um, to, to be able to like um, come into power in each of the spheres. And I guess Mexico is thinking differently about that and I, and I could understand. I think Isaiah Sage were the ones making the research on this article. So would you like to expand on, on what I just started? Yeah, okay. So this judicial reform in Mexico has been very controversial. You know, there have been protests. There were protests for like a couple weeks really throughout the country about this because some of these protesters were saying that this would basically um, increase corruption and decrease checks on the current government because electing judges could lead to um, a bias in the court system toward the current ruling Morena party. Because basically, if you elect judges like right now, like when the Morena party is popular, and you've got these judges for like these long terms, right? Like these multi-year terms throughout the country who represent a certain political party. Um, and it's not just this year when Morena is popular that they'll be serving, it's gonna be over a, a number of years. So that was a concern that it would be just like a very sudden injection of that um, partisan politics into the uh, court system the judicial system and also how basically now with this amendment um it the thought was that it would decrease corruption because there is definitely i feel like there's widespread agreement in mexico that there's corruption in the legal system right so and mexico is battling very much like there's a, an internal struggle with regard to like drug cartels and organized crime in Mexico. And, and, you know, there are other criminal matters too where corruption could be a concern, right? So they were saying the current process is too opaque, meaning like the judges are appointed by elected politicians and it's supposed to be like, they're appointed based on their um, like exam results or experience or qualifications. And then they're promoted over time through the same system basically and like have they delivered fair conclusions you know have they been like good 
at doing their job, like not showing up to work late or, you know, hung over or things like that, which is definitely an issue that we've seen in American history, you know, with judges um, not being competent or doing their job. So um, in the U.S., there are some local um, judges are elected by the people, but not all. So it's kind of interesting. And they show a record of like how the judge did at their job and everything like that. So anyway, but this is a big change for Mexico because it's like all like 7,000 some judges throughout the country would be elected. And so, yeah, the idea is that maybe it would decrease corruption because then there's more transparency about what judge occupies the, the bench, you know? But it also throws into the into the mix here the possibility that candidates who are like sympathetic to so basically these people people could elect in like even unwittingly people who have corrupt ties to like organized crime you know or to somebody else who's like saying hey will you go run for judge in this district? Like, we'll help you, we'll fund your we'll fund your campaign, we'll make you look really good, but then you're gonna basically work for us, right? Like, that's the huge concern here. But it was presented very much as like this anti-corruption thing, you know? So I, so we don't really know what the clear solution is because people were pretty clear that there was a problem with corruption in the judicial system, but there was quite a lot of sentiment that like this was not the actual solution. It was just potentially a way to make it seem like they're solving the problem, but really maybe just make some political gains for the current party that's in power for a number of years. So we'll see what we feel about that, but that is basically the overview of it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's um that's interesting. That's interesting. I think it would yeah. have been a solution in in the country where each and every citizen had the best interest of of everybody, um yeah. of the consciousness of the community at heart, um, which isn't the case at that moment anywhere in the world, I think. And yeah, I feel like for once, I want to say the solution directly. Um, I think it's always bad, but we rarely talk about it as like healing. It's like when we started this discussion, um, we were talking about like how how each country had a consciousness, how it was like a complex individual. And so like a complex individual, it had patterns and things to heal. And I really, really believe that um, this is one of those cases where um, I feel like, you know, having a sphere of the judiciary system being completely independent um, was probably the best um, and it's probably the best in, in most like republics, um, you know, countries who have republics and, and democracies. Uh, and you just gotta heal like from the inside out because like you can avoid corruption by um, displacing the responsibility on someone else. And I don't know why I said that, but I think that that's probably like the energy is like displacing there's something like displacing, but not like relieving, you know? And I don't know, it just feels a little bit weird. And and I guess even though like we cannot explain why it's weird, like I think the people know like this is like, it's, it's not what they wanted exactly. And we don't know yet the solution, but like we can trust that the vibe is like just, a little bit wonky maybe and that was not the perfect answer especially like going directly for the constitution to apply that change is a lot i would say it's it's really really a lot like um maybe it should have been tested before but 
I don't know if it would have been possible anyway. Um, so yeah, yeah. I don't know. What, what do you guys have to say about that? Yeah, so I, I agree with you. A, a constitutional change that's so significant probably needs to be far better considered than what it feels like it has. But also, I mean, if you if you if you just feel into the energy of justice, you just perceive the imbalance of this choice. And so obviously you can you can just by extension of that feeling probably predict that the legal system is gonna be more wonky than it's been, not less wonky than it's been. So yeah, I, 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 feel, I feel like the injustice that was trying to be solved might be ingrained in a different way. So for me, I don't, I don't see the solution yielding any reasonable or positive results. And because it's now entrenched in the constitution, I feel like it might even require a bigger piece of change to unwind it later. Yeah. Any other feeling, insight you guys want to share? Oh, also just the process of it is interesting because basically for the constitutional amendment to happen, there had to be a vote on it in the um, in Congress in Mexico. And then it just had to be approved by, I think it was like 60% of the um, local legislature, of the legislatures of each Mexican state. So there are like, I want to say 30 Mexican states. Sorry, my numbers might be a little, a little wonky, but they knew it was approved when um, 18 out of 30 state legislatures in Mexico had approved it. So it wasn't, and that's also similar to how it works too in the U.S. for constitutional amendments. It's you have to have like three quarters of the state legislatures approving it. But it's kind of interesting because it's like it's not a direct vote from the people. It's literally only the legislative bodies that are approving this. So, which is interesting. So that process in itself is an avenue for potential corruption because it's the decision is just among politicians who are elected, but can then be influenced, Yeah, you know, to do it. It's so it's kind of weird, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know. It do. feels like the country has more to unpack with this one to find the real solution yeah um but maybe like this change will bring more things up um to so that that can be addressed to take a step toward the actual like the real solution we're looking for here but yeah, yeah there's yeah it's interesting there's more deeper to go i think you know yeah mm -hmm. i feel like the actual amendment process is kind of reveals that there is a problem there because like even though you have an indir indirect election like the US presidency like the French Senate uh, you have to have like kind of an election before so that the elected members of the political whatever court it is um, or parliament or assembly uh, will vote and transfer your votes um, and the color of your votes um, to the highest sec, to the highest instances. So like the fact that there was no um, consultation with the people before is probably like not helping, especially in a country where they are already saying like it's too corrupted, like, and you're doing like some sort of like indirect amendment and that's probably something that is you know um you know written in the law in mexican law somewhere obviously like it probably doesn't like date from yesterday but i think that in itself is pretty weird and so if you add if you add 
any of the little weird things of of the way the the political system works, and not just in Mexico, but like I think it's a good example. I can kind of see paint a picture of like how a system can definitely go downhill fast or or uphill. Um, because of all these little things that are not really tweaked to perfection or adapted to what the people really uh, desire or want. And um, yeah, I think there may be a level of control to heal there. But then again, like I think a lot of political leaders in the world do have a level of control to heal. Um, it just seems like Mexico has... Um, you know, seeing it, seeing it manifested in a very um, special way, not positively, but yeah, as Isaiah was saying, it's probably good if it's going to put into motion something that can make the change happen, hopefully. So we'll have to keep an eye out, an eye out on that and um, we'll see. I also feel like now that judges have, um, you have to vote for judges, they might have to become politicians. Like they have to market themselves and they have to share their values and their points. And now they're playing two roles instead of one. I mean, there might be judges that are introverted, doesn't really want to socialize and, but excellent at their judgment. And so it's kind of like they're not focused on their role, but rather have to spread themselves a bit thin to play this part in this challenging new way. But, you know, who knows? We will have to see and find out how this system works for them. I think you touched on something quite important that 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 have to wait and see energy feels very off because you then automatically re, re, like realize that the solution that has been tabled doesn't seem to be effective otherwise there wouldn't be this massive question mark over what it will actually result in. So that automatically says to me it was an ill-conceived solution if there's a question mark about the potential result. Yeah. Don't you guys feel that in a lot of countries right now, there's just this um, fishing out for a solution attempts at things that are very wonky, like uh, friends dissolving yes. the parliament and having like a one out of two percentages of it going to the far right um, or, you know, this. And I don't know what it's about, but, and I don't know why there is this level of like despair in the political sphere. But that definitely doesn't feel good to me because I can't, I don't feel like my leader, no matter what the what the challenges, should have a certain a level of desperation and and should be making like desperate attempts at at something. Um, where I don't know, I just it just feels off. And uh, I just realized that when we were talking, so yeah, that's a very new feeling. I'm just going to sit with yeah, comfortable stuff. But <laughs> yeah, it prompts many eye rolls. Like I felt that too with the proposal from the Harris campaign to be like, um, yeah, you can't buy a house, well, we'll give you $25,000 in down payment assistance. And it's just like, okay, well, it sounds like the prices of all the houses in the country are going to go up by $25,000 then because <laughs> it's like they set the prices, right? The, the seller set the prices. So it's kind of like very short-sighted. Expanding like housing stock would be a different story because you're expanding supply. So it kind of, you know, is a better effect at lowering prices probably, but, or the non-policies that we have from the other side. 
like you can see that there's a lot of just like desperate desperation like you said because when when you're being either vague and you have no policy outline or your policies are just like really populist like you know here you go like you get a house you get a house like that kind of energy then that's when we know that there's some sense of desperation so yeah not saying that's not like a detailed critique or anything but i'm just saying like that's what i perceived when you said that you know so yeah i'm, I'm really glad you brought up this energy of despair because i couldn't really like put my finger on it and now that you brought it up it's good to sit with that because it does resonate and i wanted to touch on that and with what Granville had mentioned. And it's almost like uh, politics is being run like business. And you see like wait and see and like trial and error with business because you, there's many avenues that you can try and see how that fits your niche and your audience. And so politics is not run like should not be run like business, but that's what it feels like it's being run as. That's why we have these trial and errors. And um, yeah, more to sit with. Yeah, I was going to say exactly the same thing. Um, feels like marketing and stock gambling. <laughs> and there is like a level of that in politics today. <laughs> We're in a capitalistic world, but eh, too much. Eh. No, doesn't feel good. Um, yeah, I think people really have to sit with the fact that um we we have to we have to accommodate with change and, and progress and and change and progress are out of like stock market responses. Um, which means uh for people that even if they perceive them as progressive or they're just like moving upon on the market that there is no solution on like anymore. And uh, I think people have to realize that um, we, we could like tell them or bat them over it like a um, hundred times, but they kind of on some level have to come to that conclusion with themselves. And that's maybe why we're experiencing like so much discomfort in politics right now. But yeah, I guess more to come, even though that doesn't feel quite good to have to wait and see. Um, I think that's what we need to sit with right now. So so I wanna I wanna just maybe throw a caveat into this whole analysis of it in terms of the business in politics. I want to say from a business point of view, when your company has a problem, you table a solution that probably solves the problem to a greater extent than 60%. It's not a speculative game as if you were prospecting on a stock market and things like that. So I absolutely feel like there is definitely a place for business type tactics in politics because you cannot promise people the funding of housing and all of those kind of things without actually considering the very real financial question of where is the money going to come from? Just like when you say, I'm going to support this country in defending themselves, I'm going to support that country in defending themselves. You are taking money that could have been employed elsewhere in your country to make your citizens have a better standard of living in order to support in other places. And I mean, it, it is a difficult trade-off because you do not want the advancement of evil 
in other places because the, the because the ripple effect that is that it will eventually hit you because we are so interconnected as countries globally. So I, I want to say that there is definitely more of a science to business tactics than there is an art. And therefore, that science is what needs to apply to your politics as well. So that when you say, I'm going to stand up and we are going to solve the problem of housing. You scientifically solve the problem of housing from the perspective of, yes, there are certain buildings that can be converted to low cost residential housing. But there's also certain land that can be developed. And there's also certain infrastructure that requires spending in order to ensure that that regional and town planning is effective. So there's definitely, for me, a much greater relationship between with tactical planning from a business point of view that needs to filter into politics. Yeah. Um, there's something there. Uh, and I think... That science that we're talking about, it needs to start including the fact that um, decisions should not be based on fear, but also you should not like jump again and and go completely like suicide mission on on your bold uh on a bold decisions. And the only thing that can um actually solidify this as a science is following the good feeling. In, in business, following a good feeling in politics, following a good feeling anywhere. And I think we're um, getting back to the unionism standpoint right now because of how important it is. We're seeing this in every area and the fact that the fear does not solve your answers. And that's also the subject of um, the other topic, the next topic. But Nadja, did you want to say something? Yes. I'm glad you sat with this, Granville, because um, for me, it would require a bit of clarification what type of business in what sectors within the government. For example, you can have a nonprofit business and for profit business. And if we were to run charities, hospitals in certain ways that are for profit, then you can already tell that they're scrimping each quality of it to make sure that they are able to make that profit. And when it comes to certain things like your citizens' livelihood, your citizens' wellness, it should not be in the focus of for profit, but rather with that business tactic for the health and wellness of your people. And so the goal isn't for financial abundance, but just uh, overall abundance. And so you're absolutely right, but the shift in the type of business and the maneuver of business should be very clear cut. And right now it seems like they're using a business of manufacturing compared to a business of governing. So moving on to the other topic that I think is kind of related to it is the fact that the governor of Kentucky, Andy Bashir, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it. Um, banned, finally banned um, the conversion therapy in Kentucky. Uh, and he was like, there was like a years long effort to make this happen um, under Republican um, governors as well, but it was always blocked <clears throat> by civil groups. And basically, uh, Bashir is Christian, so that is interesting. I didn't know he was Demo a Democrat, but he is Democrat and Christian. And what he says is, my faith teaches me that all children are children of God and we're practicing our endangering and even harming those children. We must act. The practice of so-called conversion therapy 
hurts all children. The opponents from a group of uh, Christian counselors said, this order, like previous failed legislative efforts, is designed to promote false LGBTQ ideologies and muzzle Christian counselors, therapists, and pastors from helping children struggling with sexual orientation or gender identity confusion. David Walls, the group's executive director, said in a statement. And Bashir said, like, it simply stops the so-called therapy that the medical, oh no, eh, sorry, it does not force, he said his action does not force an ideology on anybody, contrary to conversion therapy. So I want not to touch on, like, who is right or who is wrong, like, I think we kind of all agree on this um here but i want to touch upon the clear problem that i see that i'm facing for a few weeks um in many many areas and it's that there is this remaining uh pattern of white savior christian savior that make people feel justified and i don't know vindicative, I don't know, about um, helping others. Um, but helping others only in the metrics um, and with factors of, of Christianity. And that doesn't make sense. And um, that's not what, um, that's not what religion is about. But that's not what Christianity at first was about. And Bashir is actually closer to the truth of any uh, spiritual ideologies than um, the people opposing him are. And, and I just wanted to kind of, you know, throw that in there, because I think it's important to note that even right now in 2024, which feels, again, unsettling, just like a lot of the things that we've talked about before, um, the fact that people are still behaving like Christian and white saviors, and that does not feel good at all. Um, and that feels like something built on fear and discomfort and 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 a system that I don't know, I don't know, but the system of like saying like there are Christian counselors and pastors doing their job there. Um, that feels wrong to me, but yeah. What do you guys have to say? Yeah, that's that's true because when you say we don't need to discuss like who's right and who's wrong, we it's true because you can just discuss it from the that point of view of like you you're supposed to be an example of the truth through your spiritual practice and through your life. Um, Christianity and any other religion is actually about that. Um, it should be obvious the values you're living in alignment with, with, um, Christ or consciousness or, uh, God or whatever. And it's not part of your job to sort of like try to enforce moral standards on other people. You're just offering, you're supposed to be offering an example, which people should be able to see, you know, if they're open to it and if what you're sharing actually is real and has any value, um, you, your example would show it and you wouldn't be so concerned about, like you were saying, being a savior to other people, like being like, oh, listen, like you need to change your behavior. No, no, no. It's like, if you need like help or anything like that, we can offer you the choice and show you it toward enlightenment, but only you can like walk through that door. You know, it's just, it's that mentality, right? It's like, regardless of what your views are, it's like, are you like trying to like impose stuff on other, pe other people? Or are you trying to offer an example and then offer and show the way to people, but then they have to, they have to choose it. Like, like we, in unionism, like that's definitely the case. It's never like, 
you know, why aren't you with your twin flame? I'm going to knock on your door once a day until you decide to be with your twin flame. You're sinning against God, you know, anyway, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. But there's a very fine line there because the way you worded that, um, he said that um, he pastors and, and spiritual counselors, that Christian counselors were helping um, teenagers who were confused about their sexual orientation. The marketing there, again, is very well thought mm -hmm. because a lot of people are saying like, oh, you're just going to listen to me. Sorry, and no matter what, you, what I say, like... I'm the master of my decisions. The problem is that within the walls, like um, people are being forced um to, yeah, I don't know. But like, I think it's a very wrong idea um and a very core healing that we have to do that basically take to the thousand years back um about the fact that um you cannot. Even if you see that a way to do something is enlightenment for you, um, you can force somebody else to to do that. Otherwise, like you risk like um messing with that person's um psyche and health, and also they they are the master of their decision, no matter what, like whatever your ideas are and. And also, like, it's the wrong thing to feel like uh, people can only be saved by abiding to a certain dogma. And that's not even what is purported in, in the Bible. So I don't understand what, where this ideology actually comes from. But, yeah, I think it's like a misrepresentation, misinterpretation, but so far off from was well, actually like the truth because like Jesus was like dining with the worst sinners in 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 the Bible the the like the absolute worst outcasts you could think of and where did we where did we um become this enclosed thing where salvation comes only from looking exactly like me like i don't i really don't understand but yeah hey uh, Yorin, i think you're speaking to uh, the core concept that both you and sage are speaking to is respecting somebody else's humanity and yes there will be confusion in kids growing up so fucking what Maybe that's part of their lesson to learn, to honor their own choices. But if you take their choice away, you are not honoring their humanity and their human experience. And we have all learned in various ways through various decisions and choices that we've made. Some worked out well and they have provided a valuable lesson in making solid decisions and others haven't worked out so well. And they've also provided a valuable decision in make a, a valuable lesson in making healthy and solid decisions and choices. So if you do not, if people do not honor the humanity and the sovereignty of even that little child or that teenager that's confused in one way or another, you take away their human agency that says, I have the right to act on my needs, my desires, while, while never hopefully never impacting other people, I have the sovereign right to make decisions here. And that is about honoring the humanity. And people need to stop believing that they can save people from themselves, unless, of course, it's circumstances where they are going to do irreparable damage to themselves or others. Mm hmm I was going to say along the lines of what you were saying, and it feels like if someone were to force you to do something, even within a religious context, it feels that you are trying to play God here. 
So the arrogancy of you playing God while also trying to spread the light is very counterintuitive. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like... Uh... Sorry, that. snaps from Claudia, snaps from <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like um I mean yeah that he the humanity and the self exploration is so important and some people aren't confused some people are just gay and trans and that is okay and like we that's a, like that's very important to <laughs> to recognize like um like that like yeah yep. you know like we we accept all humans and uh I think, um, yeah, like as a trans man, that uh, exploration for me was um, a huge part of um, me really be being able to discover who who I am and and know who I and know for like be confident in who I am because I went through um, my my process. You, you know, everyone um, that everyone's process should be um, honored and um, everyone deserves to be able to go through their their own process of um discovering who they are and um being able to honor that and just be be themselves and be authentic be authentically them you know absolutely uh perfectly added there and to finish up the point i think uh you know we're talking about the science of things feeling good and and changing according to what feels good and what feels not good. And the fact is that this lowers our past on the very real statistics that the mental health of LGBTQ plus teenagers was rapidly declining because of conversion therapy. So there are numbers here and I think it's very important to ground into the reality of, of what is there and really treat um, everything. If you want to treat everything business-like, we have a logical mind, that's fine. But we need to really go all the way with that, not just, not just where um, it's convenient for us. And that also means that we need to have a balanced system where we can think on our feet, feel what feels good for us, what feels good for others, what is loving, learning to love others again and again, not being uh, so not humble as to not really thinking about that um, important step. And, and grounding it into numbers and statistics to make back rational decisions if need be. And yeah, I think... Um, that perfectly rounded, um, like this discussion on conversion therapy. Like I, I feel like we couldn't have had like a, a better, you know, um, conversation. I guess and and really like uh, uncovering everything that was there in just just such a short article. So, we are going to leave it at that for today. And thank you to everyone who has watched us live and watched us on YouTube. If you enjoy this discussion, please like, subscribe, and comment so we can do more of those and, and share your opinion on what we talked about and also on future topics that you would like us to, to speak to. See you soon. Bye-bye.